glad you're able to join us on the second Sunday after the Epiphany. We're able to bring the nice winter cold out there. Nice and terrible. Um, for many of you to know. Uh, anyway, glad you're able to join us today and uh, for those who are joining us online. Uh, we'll be following the order of setting, the order of service, divine service setting three, as for you today, on page 184. And we begin with our opening hymn, number 402. Thank you. 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses says, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should, should, should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the Church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Do whatever he tells you. 
Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, for the servants had, who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory. His disciples believe in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. God's glory 
was revealed in how he rescued Noah and his family through the ark. God sent ten disastrous plagues on Egypt and destroyed Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. And his glory was revealed, bringing Israel safely across the sea on dry ground. And so here at this wedding, people have already had enough to drink, as the master of the feast says. They aren't in any special need, simply a want they are lacking, more wine. Jesus gives it to them. He uses his miraculous creating power to give to these party guests something pleasant to gladden their hearts. This epitomizes God's grace. He gives to those who do not deserve it. Jesus' glory is revealed when he shows his undeserved love. The purpose of Jesus revealing his divine glory is so that people will believe in him and be saved. When Jesus manifested his glory by turning water into wine, his disciples believed him. And this further shows that faith is created not by God showing wrath, but by God showing his grace and mercy. Now there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification. Stone here represents the law, as Moses received the law on tablets of stone. Jewish rites of purification remind us that the law can only command our outward actions that cannot purify our hearts. The number six is significant for the number of the six days of creation that lacks the seventh day of rest. This shows us that by works of the law, we will never find rest. <coughs> Rather, we always fall short, as St. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 3. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. So no matter how often you wash the outside of the body in ritually pure water, no matter how diligently you strive to fulfill God's law, it remains unfulfilled. And you find no Sabbath rest. Jesus turns the water of these six stone jars wine, demonstrating that he is the creator who created all things in just six days. By turning water into wine, Jesus forever changed the function of these water jars. No longer could be used for ritual purification. Just so, by converting us to the Gospels, we are no longer slaves of the law, and set free from the law's condemnation. The water and the stone jars could never cleanse the heart, so the law could never make a person righteous on the inside. And as the wine goes deep into the body and changes him from the inside out, just so the gospel penetrates deep into the sinner and changes him into a new man. The law can only threaten. Do this, or you will die. Don't do this or you will die. Yet as much as we train our outward limbs and senses to obey the decrease of the law, our heart remains untouched. The law may threaten eternal hell with fire and torture, but this cannot turn the heart from unbelief. It's the only thing that can change the heart of man is God's love. St. John says, we love as God first loved us. So it is fitting that the first of these miracles of grace, which reveal Jesus' divine glory, is done at a wedding. St. Paul tells us that the church is Jesus' bride. Jesus is the bride. Moreover, he says that a wife should submit to her husband as the church submits to Christ. That a husband should love his wife as Christ loved the church gave himself up for her. Well, how does a husband get his wife to submit to him? Can he do it through threats and rules and commandments? He may get a servant that way, he will never get a devoted wife that way. And so Jesus does not win his bride over with threats or rules. He wins her over by showing grace and mercy. 
Disciples believed in Jesus because Jesus used his divine power to love. We believe in Jesus for the same reason. We are conquered by Jesus' love. When we consider baptism, the Lord's Supper, the preaching of the gospel, the absolution, these are not things that are considered glorious by the world. They're ignored, mocked, and neglected. But when these things confront a sinner who's tried to wash himself over and over again by means of the law, yet over and over again falls short, the glory of these means of grace is revealed. When we see that God is merciful to us, that he gladly forgives us our sins, then we cling to the signs of that forgiveness. We believe in him. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the community of believers. Those who believe in Christ's promise of forgiveness and salvation are members of Christ's church. Well, in a way, the Virgin Mary also is a symbol of the church. Because she is Jesus' mother, and she becomes our mother through faith. Every remarkable thing the Virgin Mary did was through faith in God's word. Mary told the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. And so the church, the community of believers, tells the servants of the church, it is the pastors, to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. It was the servants at the wedding feast poured water into stone jars and drew out wine, so do the pastors of Christ's church carry out seemingly mundane tasks. Christ works miracles through them. A pastor pours water on a child's head and says the words of Jesus. That child is, becomes a child of God, washed clean of all sin. A pastor says the words of Jesus over bread and wine, and that bread and wine becomes the very body and blood of Christ, ready to forgive the sins of all who eat it in faith. The pastors preach a message prepared for them by Christ. The Holy Spirit works for their words to change hearts, forgive sins, and make saints of sinners. In the service of these men, Christ manifests his glory to sinners, wins them over as believers and members of his church. When Mary first told Jesus that they had run out of wine, Jesus responded by saying that his hour had not yet come. Now Jesus' hour usually refers to his passion. He's betrayed in the hands of sinful men, flogged, spit upon, and mocked, and finally crucified to death. But this was to be Jesus' first miracle. After Jesus began performing miracles, his course to the cross was accelerated. Soon he would find no place to lay his head and would be pushed out into deserted places until he finally returned to Jerusalem to be crucified. It seems peculiar that Jesus told his mother that his hour had not yet come, and then shortly after he performed the very miracle needed. Jesus told his mother his hour had not yet come. Was he speaking of mere minutes? Did he mean to say, come back in five? Why this soft rebuke over a few minutes? Well, the hour of Jesus' crucifixion was determined from eternity. Just as Jesus returned to judge the living and the dead, and just as Jesus coming in human flesh in the fullness of time. Yet this does not mean that God is not moved by our prayers. My hour is not yet come, Jesus says. Then he does exactly what he has been asked. It seems that Jesus accelerated his hour planned from eternity on account of the prayer of his mother, who is herself a symbol of the church. So also Jesus accelerates his mercy toward us when he hears the prayers of his church. It's not at the right time. We say that often in one form or another. People say they'll start coming back to church when things calm down, when the weather improves, when work is under control, they've got out, when they've got sorted out some personal things in their lives. 
even when the weather gets better. People say such things to themselves much more than they say it to their pastor. I'll go to church at the I'll go to Christ at the right time. The right time is now. You need God's grace now. Tomorrow is not a given. Jesus stands ready to give you his grace, even if it isn't just the right time. Don't wait until you've got it all sorted out, until you've gotten control of your sins or emotions or work or health. Ask Jesus now and expect his forgiveness and his mercy, as he has promised in his word. If he can perform his first miracle when his hour has not yet come, if he can change the hour, he will certainly help you when you're not ready. <coughs> Jesus turned water into wine without growing a vineyard, or harvesting grapes, or crushing the grapes and aging in the must. So in the sacrament of the altar, Jesus turns wine into his own blood. <coughs> Yet that blood did not get there by such peaceful means. The sacrament of the altar is the true body and blood of Christ under the bread and wine for us Christians to eat and to drink. Bread is made from grain. Yet before the grain can be turned into bread, violence must be done. <coughs> grain must be crushed, pulverized into flour and baked. So Jesus' body, which is given to us with the bread, was crushed. He was nailed to the cross and baked to perfection, so to say as he gave up his spirit for our sake. Wine, too, is made from grapes through violence. The grapes must be squeezed and crushed until the juices pour. So Jesus' blood was poured out of his body for the forgiveness of our sins. The grace we receive in church through the proclamation of the gospel and the sacraments is given freely to us. We receive it as a gift through faith apart from our works. But this grace is not free. Jesus paid the ultimate price for it. There is no sacrament of the altar or baptism without Jesus being killed and shedding his blood for our sake. There is no absolution, nor can you see God's glory apart from the glory of the cross where God died for our sins. Jesus' disciples believed in Christ when his glory was made manifest at a wedding. The entire Christian church believes in Christ as his glory was made manifest on the cross. It doesn't look like glory. In fact, it looks pathetic and gruesome. And on the cross, our God showed his great love and mercy and accomplished the greatest good for us. He won for us forgiveness of sins, and made baptism, the sacrament of the altar, absolution, and the proclamation of the gospel, effective cures for our sins. On the cross, Jesus laid down his life for his bride. His glory was made manifest in his love. And so the church believes in, trusts in, and submits to her husband willingly, and gladly receives every good thing from him. Amen. And may the peace of God surpasses all human understanding with your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand as we sing the honor.
Be the father of the lonely and forsaken, the helper of the sick and needy, and the comforter of the distressed and sorrowful. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that of your grace you have instituted holy matrimony, in which you keep us from unchastity and other offenses. We implore you, send your blessing on every husband and wife. Do not let them provoke one another to anger and strife. Let them live peaceably together in love and godliness. Strengthen them with your gracious help in all temptations, and help them to rear their children in accordance with your will. Grant us all to walk before you in purity and holiness, putting our trust in you and leading such lives on earth that in the world to come we may have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, God will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
Yeah. Mm-hmm.